waiting a long time for this one. So, uh, for those of you with Bibles and notes, Jude 21. this morning with cereal and play with on my iPad and it's just covered in grease and now the screen won't work. Dad problems. <laughs> John said you want to use my notes. You know what? I'll take it in case this goes really awry. God's put it in my heart, so the word will be given. <laughs> Ephesians, we're going to start with the of Jude 21. I'm starting with this, though, because I'm fancy. Uh, Ephesians 2, 4. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us. Today we're going to talk about the prophetic mercy of God. <clears throat> But before we do that, Ephesians 2, 4, that his mercy has been extended to us because of his love for us. So to talk about the mercy of God, we must talk about God's love. That's why I love that we did that song. <laughs> that God loves you. And not with a fickle, wavering, substitutional, conditional love, but an unfailing, unwavering, eternal one. A love that shows you before the foundation of the world was laid. Love from a God that saw the worst things that you would ever do and still, still he chose to set his affections and his love upon you. That you could never have too much sin. You could never have too many mistakes. So much evil that God could not and would not love you. A man's sins always melts away within the power of his blood if they so choose. A love so immeasurably deep that when his creation, mankind rejected him in the garden, he didn't quit loving us. He simply found new channels to lavish, love, lavish us with it by sending his only begotten son, Jesus, to die on the cross to restore us to that sonship once again. Our beginning is marked by God's love from eternity past and our future is marked by God's love into eternity future. And as, his, as, and as his children, every manner, everything that God does in your life, every way with which he handles us, comes flowing forth of his love for us. And from our Father's love comes so many things. Grace, kindness, gentleness, wrath, justice, holiness, jealousy today. But today, as we look at the prophetic uh, prophecy, what I want to look at is mercy. Today we're going to look at the prophetic nature of God's mercy. That flows forth from His love. So with that, part one, today's text, we're in Jude 21, I'm going to start with Jude 20. But you, beloved, the church, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Jude is telling us to build ourselves up on our most holy faith, then tells us to pray in the Spirit, to keep ourselves in the love of God, and then finally to build ourselves up on the most holy faith by looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Okay, so... For the church to build ourselves up in the most holy faith, we need to be looking for the mercy of, the, of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Now, what's the mercy? That word, mercy, Jude uses here, is taken out of the book of 1 Enoch and is the descriptive word used here to describe the Lord's return, and specifically, the rapture of the church. Now, some of you may not know what that word means, 
The rapture comes from the Latin word raptus, which is a translation of the Greek word harpazo, which is used 14 times in the New Testament. And that word means to snatch away. That one day the church is going to be snatched out of here. We will suddenly be removed. That's what Jude is talking about. That God, in his abundant, lavish love for his people, for his suffering, persecuted church, he will take his bride out of a sin-ridden world and will bring us into the heavenly of heavens. And God will do this. Why? Because he loves us. God loves his church. God loves you. And so we're told he's coming to get you. <laughs> he's coming to take you out of all this chaos. And before we get any further, I want to be fair and non-divisive and say that the church by and large knows that Jesus is coming to take his people. We almost all agree where we differ is the timing of this. Has anyone ever heard the term pre, mid, or post-trip before? Hands, hands, okay, most, yeah, I didn't list that. Um, and what it is, the tribulation, the great tribulation is that book of Revelation, that one all the way at the end with all sorts of crazy things happening. That's, that could be about seven years. Seven years of the great tribulation. The church is currently in tribulation, but it will be the great tribulation, okay? Some people think that Jesus is coming before that happens. Some people think Jesus is gonna come while it happens. And some people think Jesus is coming after it all happens. And before we move on, it's important you know that where I'm coming from, I'm a preacher of that. I think Jesus has taken us out of here before the seven years of the book of Revelation is placed. Now, here's the misnomer. A lot of people think people become pre-trip because it's the easiest option. <laughs> like you're presented three options and you go, well, I'll take the non-persecuted one. Well, that's not really fair. Um, and I'm pre-trip, and this is important for you to know for, for three reasons. One, in Revelation, God pours out his wrath upon the earth. But as believers, where has all of our wrath been poured out upon? Jesus. We don't receive the Father's wrath because it's already been poured out on another. Also, why would God bloody his own bride before the marriage supper of the Lamb? Doesn't make sense. Also, in 1 Thessalonians 1, Paul tells us that Jesus will rescue us from the coming wrath. That word used here by Paul is used six times in the book of Revelation, and it all talks about the Father's wrath on the world. So I believe for that reason we're out of here. Secondly, this is a big one, this is a pet project of mine, but I'm a big fan of church history. And unfortunately, most of church history is not pre-trip. Most of church history thinks that the church has to go through it. However, the earliest church fathers, the earliest guys, believed the word pre-tribulation. So there's a really important guy by the name of Irenaeus. Um, he wasn't perfect. He was a fallible man because the best of men are men at best, right? So he's a fallible guy. But he was the apostle of Polycarp. Polycarp was the apostle of John who wrote the book of Revelation. And, and Irenaeus, in his book, in his Refutations of Heresy, specifically book five, he says that he was talking to Polycarp, who had learned from John that the church was being taken out of here before the tribulation. Okay, so the earliest guys, the, the disciples of the apostles were pre-tribulation. I think that's important. Thirdly, <laughs> this one's really quick. The word church is mentioned 19 times in the first three chapters of Revelation. And between chapters 4 and 18, which is the description of the tribulation, the word church isn't mentioned once. So, <laughs> Israel doesn't, the church not once. What did Jesus say? We're going to be out of here like a thief in the night. We will be snatched out of here. That is my biblical view. Uh, that's where I'm coming from. And listen, there are great men in other camps. There are men much more equipped than I am <laughs> that take different views. Uh, but I believe pre-trib to be the most biblically faithful. And listen, here's, here's the point. If you disagree, that's okay. What did Jesus say? We would never know the day or the hour. Wouldn't it be silly to fight over the day or the hour? <laughs> it would be really silly. So disagreements are okay. Divisions, not okay. Now back to Jude. Jude is telling us the church that to build ourselves up in the most holy faith, we should be looking for the harpazo, for the rapture of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, it's a little bit tricky to look for the rapture when Jesus tells us no one knows when it's going to happen. <laughs> it's also a little bit tricky when Jesus tells us he's going to return like a thief in the night. 
Uh, so how can we possibly anticipate the moment if we're told we couldn't possibly anticipate the moment? <laughs> and this gets even more difficult uh, in the story of the ascension. Remember right before Jesus ascends, he goes, I'm going to return the same way I just left. And he oh, goes up, and the 120 are staring up, waiting for him to come back. Remember, two angels appear, and they go, what are you doing? Go, go, go get to work. <laughs> go, go get into something, right? So we're told to look for his coming, and then we're told to stop looking for his coming. And what's happening at the ascension is the two angels are basically instructing the church to not build their lives upon looking. Do not spend your life trying to date the rapture. And what Jude expands upon is we're told to build, diligently build up the church to keep ourselves in the love of God, to be in spirit-led prayer, and then, then we can look for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is exactly what John the Baptist did. What was his message? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Repent, then look. Bow to the king, then look for the kingdom. Get your heart right, fellas, and then you can anticipate. Okay, so the two dynamics that are happening here are, one, we only look for the Lord as a means of building up the church, not as a means of scratching our curiosity. So prophecy is worst served in speculation, and unfortunately, that's typically how it's served. The other dynamic, the second one, is we only look for the Lord once we are in pursuit of serving the Lord and building up his church and the people and his people in the faith okay and this is big prophecy the information you get today should spring you into a godly fervent activity prophecy at its core was designed to energize you for Christian service why do you think the book of Revelation opens with seven letters to seven different churches it was to spring them into action. Prophecy was meant to build the body of Christ in love for their leader, Jesus Christ, and to build unity in and around the local church. Okay, so healthy biblical prophecy, there's a fancy word for that called eschatology, it just means study of the end days, should spring you into action, into building the church, into building your faith in Jesus Christ our Lord, should give you endurance. What are we told? They're told in Revelation that the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And what was Jesus? He was a missionary. <laughs> prophecy at its core must be mission, if it be from God. Now, a little footnote here before we move forward. I love prophecy. When I was thinking about that, I thought about, remember Oprah when she was talking about how much she loves bread? That's how I feel about prophecy. I love it. I love it. But I have to safeguard myself because I get really enthusiastic and get a bit carried away. Okay, I love it. However, it has been in my experience that the Christians that I know that have a steady diet of prophecy. Anyone know anyone like this? Okay, they, they go to the prophecy conferences, they buy the DVDs, they can tell you about the four phases of the chair, they can tell you about the church seven seven phases of church history through the seven letters of the churches and the opening of Revelation. They can do all that. And unfortunately, the people that I know that have a steady diet of prophecy rarely ever do anything with it. <laughs> if this is you, and your head's filled with all this knowledge, and it hasn't inspired you towards Christian service, you do not understand prophecy at all. <clears throat> to have all this head knowledge on prophecy and no activity, no heart knowledge on prophecy, is to not really know prophecy at all. Think about it like this. Imagine the church of Thyatira in the opening of Revelation. They received a letter, and it was about sexual impurity. What if the church in Thyatira received it and go, hmm, that's good, but what do you think God's really saying? <laughs> a lot of believers do that. They look at passages like Revelation 4, and it's the throne room of God, and, and light is reflecting off of, uh, refracting off of a sea of glass, and God is mighty, and there's trumpets and waters. And I'm listening to sermons, and they're like, what do you think light green means? Like they get lost in all the details and never walk away with God is king. He is Lord of the universe. I must bow to him. And so the trap for prophecy is to get so involved in the details that we never let it move us to its design. And that was missions. 
to move us and stir us to love on people, to witness to people, to wake us up and say the time is at hand. <sighs> Typically it's all head knowledge and often produces little or no fruit. So be aware that if this is you, and I don't have anyone in mind, but if this is you, I highly recommend you figure out why prophecy was given and then start there. By nature, everyone wants to turn water into wine, and no one wants to fill up the water jars. You know those things were 40 pounds? They had to carry them down to the town well, fill up 40 gallons of water. So the next time you're carrying a gallon of milk home from the grocery store, don't complain. Think about 40. And they had to carry them back to the party, right? That's what was required for the water to wine. Okay? We, by nature, we want to see the kingdom of God, but what? We don't want to repent. We must be moved by God's character before we be moved by God's mysteries. And if we reverse the order, we only damage ourselves. So, that's what Jude's talking about. That's part one. What does the text say? I'll make it simple. And it says, look for the rapture as a means to build the church in our faith upon our foundation, which is Jesus and his apostles. That's what Jude's talking about. Part two, let's do what the text is telling us. Let's do what the text is telling us. Let's do exactly what Jude is saying. Let's look. Let's look for the return of the Lord. Now, keep in mind everything that I'm about to share, and I am so excited. I've been secretly working on this for months, I'm going to be honest. I am so, okay, one of, the, one of the things that I'm about to share, every single one of these prophecies was written hundreds of if not thousands of years before these events transpired. Okay, so these things that I'm about to share would have been impossible to tamper with or to fabricate. Okay, the fact that rabbis in Jerusalem right now have scrolls of Isaiah, scrolls of Zechariah, but have the Pentateuch, have the Torah, and they all testify of who Jesus Christ would be, and all those scrolls predate the birth of Christ. Make it beyond any reasonable doubt that statistically this would have been impossible to happen, let alone it would have been impossible to tamper with. Okay, so in Hebrew, Aramaic, Greek sources that we have that all predate Christianity, prove, I want you to get this, there were over three hundred prophecies about Jesus Christ when he would come. And every single one of them was fulfilled. All predate the birth of Christ. Held by our people that don't agree with it. They hold the evidence for us. That 300 things specifically needed to happen in order for Jesus to be the Messiah. And he fulfilled every single marker. Now I got some of this from Steve Lawson. If it's a lot to chew on, I'm sorry, but here you go. It was prophesied that the Old Testament, that Jesus would be born of the seed of Abraham, Jesse, and David. He would be born of a virgin, called Emmanuel, born in Bethlehem. Great persons would come in and to adore him. There would be the killing of children in Bethlehem. He would be called out of Egypt. He would be preceded by a forerunner. He would be anointed with the Holy Spirit. He'd be a prophet like Moses, a priest after the order of Melchizedek. We're going through Hebrews right now. That's fleshed out. That's fun. He would be entering into his public ministry in Galilee. He would be entering publicly into Jerusalem and would come into the temple. He would live in poverty and meekness and tenderness and compassion. He would be without deceit. He'd be full of zeal, preaching with parables, working miracles, bearing reproach. He would be rejected by his own Jewish brethren. The Jews and the Gentiles would combine together against him. He would be betrayed by a friend. The disciples would forsake him. He would be sold for 30 pieces of silver at that price that would be given for a potter's field. He would die with intense sufferings, yet be silent under that suffering. He would be struck on the cheek. His vestige would be marred. He would be spit upon and scarred. His hands and his feet would be nailed to the cross. He would be forsaken by God. and would cry out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? 
He would be mocked. Gall and vinegar would be offered to him. His garments would be parted. Lots would be cast for his clothing. He would be numbered among the transgressors. He would intercede for his murderers. He would die, but not a bone on his body would be broken. Said he would be pierced long before crucifixion was ever invented. He would be buried with the rich. His flesh would not see corruption. He would be raised from the dead. He would ascend back to the right hand of God the Father. And all of this recorded hundreds of years before Jesus ever even entered into the world. And many of these prophecies are not fulfilled by his friends, but by his enemies, who stand to lose the most in their fulfillment. <clears throat> to this day, did you know many Jews are forbidden to even read the book of Isaiah? Because it's so damning. It, it so clearly points to the fulfillment of Christ. And there are over 300 of these. Now this doesn't stop at Jesus. What about during the early church age, between 32 AD and 132 AD? Did you know there were 36 more prophecies fulfilled in that time span? In Exodus 25, 30, we're told the priesthood would change. Jeremiah 31, we're told animal sacrifices would come to an end. Matthew 24, every building on the Temple Mount would be destroyed, which it was in 70 AD. Daniel 11, 30 and 33, that the Jews would be dispersed by the Romans. Deuteronomy 28, that Israel would be destroyed by the Romans, as shown by an eagle. And remember, these prophecies were predicted and recorded, in some cases, well over a thousand years before they were fulfilled to a T. Guys, if we look, if we simply look on the basis of what has already been fulfilled and accomplished, we may find strength in what he promises he will continue to accomplish. By looking at fulfilled prophecy, we see that pending prophecy, like the rapture, is true. It may happen at any moment as he has promised. And we're not done, let's keep going. Between 132 AD and 1948, seven years ago, we have 24-ish prophecies fulfilled. From Rome's division to Rome's collapse, Edom made desolate, Egypt's independence, Turkey's independence, Syria's independence, all of these things came to pass hundreds of thousands of years after they were first penned. So a month ago, we had a Q&A here, and the Ravencrosses uh, have a little boy named Colton, and he asked a great question. He said, how do we know heaven is real? I thought, boy, that's a great question from a five-year-old. Is he five? Six. six? That's a great question from a six-year-old. And all the adults are going, ooh, you know. <laughs> and I, I said, question, what did you have for breakfast this morning? And he said, waffles, which sounded delicious. I'm on keto, right? And he, waffles. <laughs> and I said, question, is mommy going to make you breakfast tomorrow? And he looked at me like, duh, right? I said, how do you know that? He just kind of gave me that six-year-old stare, you know, the one I gave you a lot of times. Uh, and I said, because mommy makes you breakfast every day. He goes, yeah. I go, so because mommy makes you breakfast every day, you know that she's going to make you breakfast tomorrow, right? Yeah. Okay, guys, God's making us waffles. <laughs> because he's always making us waffles. We know on the basis of what he's already promised and fulfilled that he's going to continue to fulfill these things. Over and over and over again, he makes the impossible reality. And he promises us, I'm not done. Breakfast is coming tomorrow. I promise you, it's coming. About a fourth of our Bible is prophecy. It was at least when it was first given. And almost every single thing has been fulfilled. And so as we look at what's been fulfilled, it will build us up in our most holy faith for what he will do next. And this is where I really want you to lock in, and this is the fun part. What about the last 70 years? Question, and I, if you don't want to be ratted out, don't raise your hand. Who here is 70 or older? Anyone raise their hand 70 or older? God bless you, by the way. You're running your race well. Uh, and a testament to us young folks to keep going. Um, so in, in people in this room's lifetime, they've lived through this. Okay, this is not some, this isn't like four score and seven years ago. I mean, this is to now. In the last 70 years, over 53 prophecies have been fulfilled. 53. 
In, in 1,800 years, before 70 years ago, we had 24. In the last 70, we've had over 50. So what happened? Why the recent increase in prophetic and fulfillment? And simply, if we look at what's being fulfilled right now, we're starting to see the stage set for the book of Revelation. It's all being brought together for us right now. It's being brought together right now, right before our eyes, in our families' lives. It's happening right now. That the events that are happening right now are setting us up for the return of the Lord is as implicit in Hosea 4 5. And so whether you're pre or you're mid or you're post-trip, regardless of your timing of the rapture, at the very least, the great tribulation is upon us. At the very least, revelation is upon us. It's because it's all being perfectly lined up and prepared. And so why now? Why all of these prophecies being fulfilled now? What happened 70 years ago that placed us in this incredible, cosmically transitional period of human history? And that is the fulfillment that the nation of Israel must be reestablished as a nation. That was when history took a turn. That is when things sped up at an exponential rate. The book of Revelation is filled with Israel. And so in order for the book of Revelation to come to fulfillment, surprise, surprise, Israel must be reestablished. Now between 70 AD and 132 AD, this is important for you guys to know, Israel was completely devastated and exiled. They had two Jewish revolts, the Romans were sick of them, they completely wiped out the land, burned down the temple, and said any Jew that enters Israel, death penalty. They were as done as done could be. And so much so, after a few decades, Christian theologians, now imagine, you're a Christian, you're a theologian, you're looking for the return of the Lord, and Israel's dead. You're really struggling. How do you handle the book of Revelation when it's filled with references to Israel and Israel's gone? For the Antichrist to appear, there must be an Israel. For the Lord to return, there must be an Israel. For the, anti for, for the, deso the, the, the abomination of desolation, the, the temple must be there. So around 150 AD, this is important because it'll explain where a lot of these teachings are coming from now. Sections of the church started to say that the book of Revelation was not to be taken literally. That all of those references to Israel really must mean the church. Okay, this is called, has anyone heard the term replacement theology? Ever heard the term? Okay, that's kind of a derogatory term for people that ascribe to it. It's like, don't you call me that. Uh, so the nice word is covenant theology, or they really like fulfillment theology, because that sounds really positive. Uh, I'm going to use replacement and covenant just because they're talking about the church being replaced. I don't think it's derogatory anyway. Um, and that, the covenant theology, replacement theology, is, and they believe that all of the unfulfilled prophecies concerning Israel will be fulfilled in the church. So for, and for example, in Revelation, all the references to Israel in Revelation don't mean Israel, it means the church. Okay? And this really makes Revelation unintelligible when, when you go through that. But, and this thought existed through the church fathers. It existed all the way through the Middle Ages. Luther, in 1517, at the start of the Reformation, you know, he reformed everything out of the Catholic Church except their eschatology. In fact, Luther didn't even think Revelation should have been in the Bible. He didn't think it should even be in the Bible. I actually have a quote here. Again, this is from Luther. And I listen, I love Luther. But, you know, he's best of men or men at best. Again, they're supposed to be blessed to keep what is written in this book. And yet no one knows what that is to say nothing of keeping it. That's Revelation. This is just the same as if we did not have the book at all. And there are many far better books available for us to keep. That's the spirit of the Reformation. Okay, the prophecy then continued and did not get reformed in the Protestant Reformation and continued through the, through the Puritans. And the Puritans, these guys are really my heroes, they also ascribe the covenant theology. Why? Because Israel still didn't exist. It's hard to believe a book is mostly literal when the country, and that's mentioned con constantly, is, isn't around anymore. Yet, God makes the impossible possible all the time. Isaiah 11, 11, and 12. It's 
shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people who are left from Assyria and Egypt, from Pathros and Cush, from Elam and Shinar, Hamath and the islands of the sea. He will set up a banner for the nation, will assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. In 1922, the British signed something called the Balfour Declaration to make room for a nation state of Israel once again. And in 1945, after the atrocities of the Jewish people through the Holocaust, they handed it over to the newly established UN. The UN took three years in council and finally made a proclamation recognizing the modern state of Israel. And on that day in 1948, 20 different prophecies came to fulfillment in one moment. There was a transition in human history, and the impossible became possible. And in 1948, the church should have had a white bulb go on, you think? <laughs> and had another reformation of biblical prophecy. For those of you that come to Tuesday prayer, I'm always praying for prophecy, reformation in the church. And unfortunately, just like Luther had trouble with the Catholic Church, they would not leave their traditions to go back to sola scriptura through scripture alone. So in 1948, so many mainline Protestant movements would not, will not leave their traditions and go back to the Bible. I talked to these men, and I'm dealing with the same thing. But Luther said, and Calvin said, and Owen said, and Origen said, and Augustine said, and Edward said, and great men. And it's not malicious, but what does the Bible say? It says Israel, it means Israel. And in 1948, Israel was reestablished as a nation, setting up, in my opinion, the greatest exodus in human history. The exodus of the church. The harpazo, the rapture. Now, what I want to do is look a little bit more closely and do what Jude is asking of us. And I'm going to read some of these things that have been fulfilled in the last 70 years. So in Isaiah 6, 60 verse 9, 1948 is described. And listen to the detail. Surely the coastland shall wait for you. And the ships of Tarshish will come first to bring your sons from afar, their silver and their gold with them, to the name of the Lord your God and to the Holy One of Israel because he has glorified you. Isaiah says in 1948, when this happens, the ships of Tarshish will come first. Do you know in Isaiah where Tarshish is? England. Before England was even established. England and those coastal cities. God predicted after 1800 years that not only would they be reinstated, but which specific country would lead the charge in reinstating them? Isaiah 66, 8 prophesies that when Israel is reestablished, they will be reestablished in one day. Who has ever heard of such a thing? Who has ever seen such things? Shall the earth be made to give birth in one day, or shall a nation be born at once? For as soon as Zion was in labor, she gave birth to her children. And of course, that's what happened. And it is indeed shocking. Nothing like this in human history has ever occurred. Where people had been dispersed for 1,800 years and had kept their ethnic identity and were brought back and made a unified people in a day no less. In Jeremiah and Ezekiel, we're told that Israel will be planted in the ancient land of Canaan and nowhere else. So according to God, that is their land. Doesn't mean the Palestinians aren't having gone through horrible things, and we need to love on those people, but it's Israelite land. And now, according to God, in Malachi 5 5, it says, When they return, are returned, they will not have kings, but principal leaders. God foretold that the modern day of Israel would not have a monarchy with kings, but a democracy or a republic. And Jeremiah 31 says they will speak Hebrew once returned, which is fascinating because in Jesus' day, they didn't speak Hebrew. They spoke Aramaic, yet it was promised it would be returned. And of course, that was named the official language in 1948 Hebrew. A really interesting one is in Isaiah 29. Woe to you, Ariel, to Ariel, the city where David dwelt. Add year to year, let feasts come around, yet I will distress Ariel. There, will be, uh, there shall be heaviness and sorrow, and it shall be to me as Ariel. I will encamp against all uh, you all around. I will lay siege 
against you with a mound, and I will raise siege works against you. You shall be brought down, you shall speak out of the ground. Your speech shall be low out of the dust, your voice shall be like a medium's out of the ground, and your speech shall whisper out of the dust. That's a really weird passage. I imagine Isaiah wrote that, though I have no idea what that means, right? The very day the War of Independence started in Israel, Jordan proceeds to attack Jerusalem. And on that same day, the same day, the Dead Sea Scroll of Isaiah landed in Jewish hands. And out of the dust came the declaration of the war and the promised Messiah. Out of the dust he spoke. And so I think you can argue that the Dead Sea Scrolls are really important for the last days as they testify to our Messiah. Um, and we got to get going, but I don't have time for all these things. But we're told in Joel 3, Gaza will be forsaken. Jeremiah 23 talks about how Jews will come from the north, like we saw when, when they got reestablished, where they all come from, from Russia and Europe. They came from the north. Isaiah 68, it talks about tour, uh, tourism via air travel, thousands of years before air travel was invented. Zechariah 14, the six-day war is predicted and described in detail. Uh, Russia and Iran's alliance has been perfectly fulfilled in Ezekiel 28. Isaiah 11.10, that their flag would be the star of David. <laughs> the Muslim nations will not recognize the nation of Israel in Numbers 23. Ezekiel 37, that when Israel will be brought back, they will not be filled with the Holy Spirit at first. In Hosea 3, 4, and 5, that when they are brought back, their king will be called David. Does anyone know the first leader of the nation state of Israel? David ben Gurion. And God defined his, his behavior. <laughs> so God told them their first leader and his attributes thousands of years before he was even born. So, Jude tells us to look for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ. And if we look, we see everything is just about set up for his return. It's all coming together. The country in which the play is set is established. The technology for the one world currency is here. The ability to mobilize all the world's forces against a singular people is here with this outrage culture and media. The desire for the one world government is here. The Jews, the Muslims, Europe, most of Asia and America, they're all looking for a Messiah type of figure to lead them. The book of Daniel says knowledge will run to and fro. The fact that I can text somebody in China in three seconds right now says something. The fact that the evil of man has grown so great we can press buttons and nuke whole people groups. The fact that the church is mostly asleep and deceived says something. In Matthew 24, 7, earthquakes will increase, have they? In Matthew 24, 10, church disunity will increase, has it? In Matthew 24, 12, lawlessness will increase, has it? In Matthew 24, 12, people will love others less. 2 Timothy 3, love of self will grow, has it? Luke 21, 25, severe ocean activity seems to imply hurricanes. <laughs> Has it happened? Yes. The time is at hand. The time is at hand. We have been, there have been more prophecies fulfilled in the last 70 years than the last 1800. The time is drawing near. We simply need to look. Jude says, look, if we look, it is impossible to not see that Jesus is coming soon. So I want to close with a few quick thoughts. Coffee? That oh, wasn't hyper enough. First, the Bible is a peerless, unparalleled book written by a peerless, unparalleled God. This could never have happened by coincidence. Never. Jude tells us to build ourselves up on our most set-apart faith, our most holy faith. You know what that word holy means in both Hebrew and Greek? Separate. And what is the faith? It's not a call to a belief in creeds. It's a call to a belief in a person. In Jesus as Lord, and He is holy. He is separate. And the Father is holy. And the Spirit is holy. They are holy, holy, holy. They are separate, separate, separate. First Samuel 2, 2. I thought of you, Nancy. There is no one like the Lord. 
There is no one beside you. There is no rock like our God. And because God is holy and set apart and there is no other like him, so when Jesus says there is no way to the Father except through me, what does no way mean? No way. No other way. Christianity is not one truth amongst many. There is no other way. A Muslim does not find his way into heaven. An atheist does not find his way into heaven. A Buddhist does not find his way into heaven. And these may be great people who love their family, who are great to us, who are wonderful country and statesmen. But Jesus is the way. There is no way to the Father except through Jesus. There is no entrance into the kingdom except through Jesus. Jesus is the way. Jesus is the truth. And Jesus is the life. Everything else is a lie. And so we must love the Muslim. We must love the atheist. Lay down our lives for them. We must love the Buddhist enough to show them the way because eventually every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. Not a Lord, the Lord. The Lord. And I know that's not very popular in today's culture and I know that makes me sound very intolerant, but if there was any other way, Jesus wouldn't have had to need to die on the cross, would he? If, mor if morality was enough to save us, Jesus didn't have to die, but he did. He had to become our substitute for all who believe in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Remember right before Matthew 26, right before Jesus was betrayed, do you remember what he prayed in the garden? My father, if it is possible, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not as I will, but you will. God, if there is any other way to bring people into your kingdom, the answer was no. This is the only way. We have a separate faith and we must share our separate faith with an incredible urgency. Why? Because the time is at hand. The peerless book, the Bible, if we simply look, is shouting, be ready. Be ready. Have your lamps full. Get your heart right. Kill your sin. Prepare your families. Repent. The time is at hand. The book is screaming. Screaming. Secondly, as Christians, we're called to look. Why? Titus 2, 11 through 13. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our God, great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Why do we look? Because the coming of our Lord is our hope. To Jude, it's a mercy. What Jude means is that living a godly life is gloriously wonderful. It is such a joy and an honor to belong to Jesus. But it is incredibly hard. What did Jesus say? You want to follow me? Wonderful. Pick up your cross. Come on, let's go. Let's go die a little every day. And to see that the end is here, that at any moment we could be with the Lord, at any moment, no more cancer, no more depression, no more threats, no more bullies, no more addictions. What a hope to cling to. And above all that, we finally get to be with Jesus. We finally get to be with Jesus. I love that photo. That, have you ever seen that photo where that girl's bear-hugging Jesus and she's just screaming that she's so happy? That's going to be me. And I hope he doesn't say, you're too tight, you know, or whatever. I just want to hang on to him. You know, we finally get to be with him. That at any moment, any moment, everything seems to be in place for the church to be taken up, to be with our Lord. And not just that, but 2 Thessalonians, um, or the second part of this is 2 Thessalonians 4, where as Jesus calls us up, we will all be reunited. All of our loved ones who share faith in Christ will be united. Did you know when the rapture comes, when the harpazo comes, the raptus, the, the snatching away, whatever you want to call it? You know it says we will meet the dead in the air? 
your brothers, your sisters, your wife, your husbands, your, your pastors, your kids, your grandparents, your great-grandparents, all in the air, the family finally all together for the world to see. That is our home. Thirdly, and in that is not just of the hope, but also in this is accountability. Guys, looking at what's being fulfilled, it seems that after 2,000 years, I want you to wrap your head around this, we may get to see it. After 2,000 years of fervently waiting, we may get to see it. That maybe God has bestowed the honor upon us to finish the race. That after for 2,000 years the church has been waiting and some of us may actually cross that finish line. What an unparalleled honor. What an unparalleled honor. And at the same time, what an unparalleled evil to not care. To see all the signs of the Lord's coming and to be consumed about worldly things would be such a disaster. Living in an anxious, expecting hope in His return at any moment will sober us up through our righteous living. Will sober us up. Listen to 1 Thessalonians 5, 6. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch, look, and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But let us who are of the day be sober. Putting on the breastplate of, breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet of hope and salvation. Paul in this passage is telling us that the key to righteous living, to overcoming our sins, is to be awake. Awake to the fact that at any moment we could be with the Lord and shouldn't be afraid of that fact but you live in a state of eager expectation of it. It's our hope. It's our gift of mercy. Paul here is telling us to be a great man or a great woman. We need to start living awake in an eager expectation that soon we will be with the Lord. Jude in verse 21 talks about living in this expectation of the Lord, Lord's return. Then in verse 22 and 23, and spoiler alert, we're going to get here, he talks about purity. Because it's one of the keys to purity and compassion on those who aren't saved, living in this world. So I want to encourage you, true biblical prophecy is missional. The return of the Lord, the signs of the return of the Lord were designed to sober us up. To Jude 22, put an incredible urgency in us to see souls saved. To Jude 23, hate sin within ourselves. Listen, you want to stop hurting yourselves? You want to be better for those around you? Then wake up and realize the Lord is coming for his bride. A drunk man doesn't care. He's indifferent to such things. But an awake person, one who is alert to these realities, dares not be comfortable with sin. And so out of an eager expectation of the Lord's return, we are clothed in faith and love and hope. And so be awake. Look and see. See the signs of the times and be awake of who Jesus is and what he's doing. Be awake to the Father's faithfulness. Be awake to the fact that more prophecies have been fulfilled in the last 70 years than the previous 1800. The time is near and we must be ready. We must get our house in order. I meet with a pastor next Friday to just try my hardest to unite churches in the area. We must fight for unity. We must hate sin. You know, Paul said, you want to know what the Gospels are? Look at me. Somehow in our culture, that's become impossible. We're called to do our darnest. We must love our enemies. We must drag unbelievers from out of the fires of hell through both our words and our deeds. And this is our final point, two minutes. The rapture is more than our hope. It's all, more than our accountability. It's also part of our message. It's part of the Gospels to the unbelieving world. That these realities should place in us an incredible love for those not in the body of Christ. You know, me and Doc talk about this a lot. It's like you see people talk about the rapture, and it's like, and planes are going to be empty, and trains are going to be de derailed. And they're talking about like, cool. No. Those are people that are dying without 
Christ. That is devastating. To love those not saved enough to plead with them and to fervently pray and love on them. I love the Spurgeon quote. I love Spurgeon so much I named my second son's middle name after him. <laughs> if sinners be damned, at least let them leap to hell over our dead bodies. And if they perish, let them perish with our arms wrapped about their knees, imploring them to stay. If hell must be filled, let no one go unwarned and unprayed for. As I said, but in Jude 20 and 23, or 22 and 23, prophecy is missional. It always points towards eternal life. That word look in verse 21, look for the mercy in the Greek is prosdeka, the dekimos. And it means to look anxiously, to receive into oneself, to look expectantly, expectantly with butterflies in your stomach. All this information must move our hearts. It must affect our guts. If believed, we're promised this changes you. If you leave a teaching on biblical prophecy and you're unchanged, something's wrong. We're promised it changes you. Because according to Jude and Paul, prophecy, if received, moves us to righteousness and missions. This is why I started today with the missional necessity of prophecy, and now I end with the missional necessity of prophecy. Let storms get worse. They're going to. We've been promised. And let it remind us that the Lord is coming. Let us be those nutcases that see the weather channel and go, Jesus is coming, am I right? Let's go, what is wrong with you? Let the selfishness of your co-workers that make you go home and melt into your sofa like I can't go one more day. Let them remind you Jesus is coming. Let the political landscape of this country where we're viciously attacking ourselves remind us the time is coming. Let us finish our race well. We're at the 26 mile mark. We might as well. <laughs> Let's finish well. Let's make sure our kids and our grandkids know Jesus is Lord. At the very least, let them know that you think Jesus is Lord. So in the event that when they are here, when the rapture happens, they know. They know exactly what happened to that, my crazy uncle, or my mom, or my dad. Let's make such an impact. That in both our presence and our absence, our lives declare the glory of God. Let them declare our master. Let our hope of the return of the Lord both shape our character and give us a message to bring to the nations that Jesus is the Lord and he's coming for his people soon. Amen? Amen. Love you guys. Let's pray. God, we love you. What an honor and a privilege to see what you're doing. God, you have bestowed the honor upon us to see this, to clearly see this. Thank you. Now love us enough to put that message in our hearts. We, we need you to stir us for the good of the nations. We need you to stir us for our loved ones. We need you to stir us to forgiveness and unity and to let the world be left behind as we are ascended to greater things. Oh, Jesus, we adore you. Spirit, we thank you. And Father, we love you. We ask that you bless this time of giving. God, as the ushers come down, just please be with them. God, we pray that you stir us to, to, to just love on people. God, place your word in our hearts. Get our opinions out of the way and get your words front and center. God, we pray that if anyone needs prayer, uh, Dave and Deb are off to the side. We ask that you place in us a boldness, God, to, to, to ask for help. So God, we love, praise, and adore you. Thank you. Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.